Whenever Church members speak of consecration, it should be done reverently while acknowledging that each of us comes short of the glory of God, some of us far short. Even the conscientious have not arrived, but they sense the shortfall and are genuinely striving. Consolingly, God's grace flows not only to those who love Him and keep all His commandments, but likewise to those that seek so to do. A second group of members are honorable but not valiant. They are not really aware of the gap nor of the importance of closing it. These honorable individuals are neither miserable nor wicked. It is not what they have done, but what they have left undone that is amiss. For example, if valiant, they could touch others deeply instead of merely being remembered pleasantly. In a third group are those who are grossly entangled with the ungodliness of the world, reminding us all, as Peter wrote, that if we are overcome by something worldly, we are brought in bondage. If one minds the things of the flesh, he cannot have the mind of Christ, because his thought patterns are far from Jesus, as are the desires or the intents of his heart. Ironically, if the Master is a stranger to us, then we will merely end up serving other Masters. The sovereignty of these other Masters is real, even if it sometimes is subtle, for they do call their cadence. Actually, we are all enlisted, if only in the ranks of the indifferent. To the extent that we are not willing to be led by the Lord, we will be driven by our appetites or we will be more preoccupied with the lesser things of the day. The remedy is implicit in the marvelous lamentation of King Benjamin. For how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served, and who is a stranger unto him, and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart? For many moderns, sad to say, the query, What think ye of Christ? is answered, I really don't think of him at all. Consider three examples of how honorable people in a church keep back a portion and thus prevent greater consecration. A sister gives commendable, visible civic service and deserves her good image in the community. Yet she remains a comparative stranger to Jesus' holy temples and his holy scriptures, two vital dimensions of discipleship but she could yet have Christ's image in her countenance. An honorable father, dutifully involved in the cares of his family, is less than kind and gentle with individual family members. Though a comparative stranger to Jesus' gentleness and kindness, which we are instructed to emulate, a little more effort by this father would make such a large difference. Consider the returned missionary, skills polished while serving an honorable mission, striving earnestly for success in his career. Busy, he ends up in a posture of some accommodation with the world. Thus he forgoes building up the kingdom first and instead builds up himself. A small course correction now would make a large, even destinational difference for him later on. These deficiencies just illustrated are those of omission. Once the celestial sins are left behind and henceforth avoided, the focus falls evermore upon the sins of omission. These omissions signify a lack of qualifying for the celestial kingdom. Only greater consecration can correct these omissions which have consequences as real as the sins of commission. Many of us thus have sufficient faith to avoid the major sins of commission, but not enough faith to sacrifice our distracting obsessions and to focus on our omissions. Most omissions occur because we fail to get outside ourselves. We are so busy checking on our own temperatures, we do not notice the burning fevers of others even when we can offer them some of the remedies, such as encouragement, 
kindness, and commendation. The hands which hang down and most need to be lifted up belong to those too discouraged even to reach out anymore. Actually, everything depends on our desires, which shape our thought patterns. Our desires precede our deeds and lie at the very cores of our souls, tilting us toward or away from God. God can educate our desires. Others may seek to manipulate our desires. But it is we who form the desires, the thoughts, and intents of our heart. The end rule is, according as our desire shall it be done. For I, the Lord, judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their heart. One's individual will thus remains uniquely his. God will not override it nor overwhelm it. Hence, we'd better want the consequences of what we want. Another cosmic fact. Only by aligning our wills with God's is full happiness to be found. Anything less results in a lesser portion. The Lord will work with us even if at first we can do no more than desire, but are willing to give place for a portion of His words. A small foothold is all he needs, but we must provide it. So many of us are kept from eventual consecration because we mistakenly think that somehow, by letting our will be swallowed up in the will of God, we lose our individuality. What we are really worried about, of course, is not giving up self, but selfish things, like our roles, our time, our preeminence, and our possessions. No wonder we are instructed by the Savior to lose ourselves. He is only asking us to lose the old self in order to find the new self. It is not a question of one's losing identity, but of finding his true identity. Ironically, so many people already lose themselves anyway in their hobbies and preoccupations, but with far, far lesser things. Ever observant in both the first and second estates, consecrated Jesus always knew in which direction he faced. He consistently emulated his Father, saying the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what thing soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. As one's will is increasingly submissive to the will of God, he can receive inspiration and revelation to help meet the trials of life. In the trying and very defining Isaac episode, Abraham staggered not through unbelief. Of that episode, John Taylor observed, that nothing but the spirit of revelation could have given Abraham this confidence and sustained him under those peculiar circumstances. Will we too trust the Lord amid a perplexing trial for which we have no easy explanation? Do we understand, really understand, that Jesus knows when we are stressed and perplexed? The complete consecration which affected the Atonement ensured Jesus' perfect empathy. He felt our very pains before we did and knows how to succor us. Since the most innocent suffered the most, our cry of why cannot match his. But we can utter the same submissive word nevertheless. Progression toward submission confers another blessing an enhanced capacity for joy. Counsel President Brigham Young, if you want to enjoy exquisitely, become a Latter-day Saint, then live the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Thus, brothers and sisters, consecration is not resignation or a mindless caving in. Rather, it is a deliberate expanding outward, making us more honest when we sing more used would I be. Consecration, likewise, is not shoulder-shrugging acceptance, 
but instead shoulder-squaring to better bear the yoke. Consecration involves pressing forward with a steadfastness in Christ, with a brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men, while feasting on the word of Christ. Jesus pressed forward sublimely. He did not shrink such as by going only 60 percent of the distance towards the full atonement. He finished his preparations for all mankind, thus bringing a universal resurrection, not one in which 40 percent of us would be left out. Each of us might well ask, in what ways am I shrinking or holding back? Meek introspection may yield some bold insights. For example, what have we already willingly discarded along the pathway of discipleship? It is the only pathway where littering is permissible, even encouraged. In the early stages, the debris left behind includes the grosser sins of commission. Later debris differs. Things begin to be discarded which have caused the misuse or underuse of our time and talent. Along the pathway leading to consecration, stern and unsought challenges sometimes hasten this jettisoning, which is needed to achieve increased consecration. If we have grown soft, hard times may be necessary. If we are too contented, a dose of divine discontent may come. A relevant insight may be contained in reproof. A new calling beckons us away from comfortable routines wherein the needed competencies have already been developed. One may be stripped of a custom luxury so that the malignant mold of materialism may be removed. One may be scorched by humiliation so pride can be melted away. Whatever we lack will get attention one way or another. John Taylor indicated that the Lord may even choose to wrench our very heartstrings. If our hearts are set too much upon the things of this world, they may need to be wrenched or broken or undergo a mighty change. Consecration is thus both a principle and a process, and it is not tied to a single moment. Instead, it is freely given drop by drop until the cup of consecration brims and finally runs over. Long before that, however, as Jesus declared, we must settle this in our hearts, that we will do what he asks of us. President Young further counseled to submit to the hand of the Lord and acknowledge his hand in all things, then you will be exactly right. And until you come to that point, you cannot be entirely right. That is what we have to come to. Thus, acknowledging God's hand includes, in the words of the Prophet Joseph, trusting that God has made ample provision beforehand to achieve all His purposes, including in our lives. Sometimes it seems He clearly directs. Other times it seems He merely permits. Therefore, we will not always understand the role of God's hand, but we know enough of his heart and mind to be submissive. When we are perplexed and stressed, explanatory help is not always immediately forthcoming, but compensatory help will be. Thus, our process of cognition gives away to our personal submission as we experience those moments when we learn to be still and know that I am God. Then the more one's will is thus swallowed up, the more his afflictions will be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Seventy years ago, Lord Moulton coined a perceptive phrase, obedience to the unenforceable, describing the obedience of a man to that which he cannot be forced to obey. God's blessings, including those associated with consecration, come by unforced obedience to the laws upon which they are predicated. 
Thus, our deepest desires determine our degree of obedience to the unenforceable. God seeks to have us become more consecrated by giving everything. Then, when we come home to Him, He will generously give us all that He hath. In conclusion, the submission of one's will is really the only uniquely personal thing we have to place on God's altar. The many other things we give, brothers and sisters, are actually the things He has already given or loaned to us. However, when you and I submit ourselves by letting our individual wills be swallowed up in God's will, then we are really giving something to Him. It is the only possession which is truly ours to give. Consecration thus constitutes the only unconditional surrender, which is also a total victory. May we deeply desire that victory. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.